Thanks very much for staying around for my talk, the last talk of the day. Uh, so I appreciate that there's still people here. Um, I'm talking on, on the dark net. So I'm a computer scientist, right? So I work trying to find evidence of crimes, right? So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a digital forensic scientist, okay? So when most people think of the dark net, I think people think of something like this. So something that you might see in the movie, some sort of generic screen of unknown things flying by, um, something that you don't really encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, that's kind of true, yeah? So you don't really encounter this sort of stuff when you're normally using your laptop, when you're browsing the web or whatever else. So I'm going to explain what the dark net is, I'm going to explain what's on it, and loosely how we can start to sort of identify crimes that are occurring on it. So first and foremost, the internet. Most people, when you think of the internet, you think of something here. Yeah, you have Google, Facebook, Twitter, whatever. People think that, people use this term, the internet, to refer to these websites that they visit. But of course, that's only a small part of the internet. This is the latest map of the internet. What's interesting, if you look at this map, I'm sure you can all see the outlines there of all the individual nations and countries and continents. Oh no, the internet doesn't care. Yeah, so the internet, is, is, is floating on top of this idea of, of the world, yeah? So it's this inter, inter, interconnected network of computers, yeah? So the World Wide Web, all those websites that I just mentioned, that's just one application that's running on top of the internet, okay? You use other applications without even necessarily knowing it. Um, so email, uh, instant messaging, uh, Vo voice over IP, so Skype calls, all that sort of stuff. There are other applications that work on the internet. Okay, so you can think of the web as an iceberg for a second, okay? So the web that you're likely used to using pretty much sits in this 4% at the top, yeah? So pretty much everything here, it's called the surface web, everything that's here is indexed by your search engine. Most people use Google as their first port to call when they're looking for something. So Google looks at this 4%, okay? The rest of the web is referred to as the deep web, okay? Which is not accessible through Google, okay? That's embarrassing. No. Um, so it's not, 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 not accessible through Google. Google can't see it. But of course the deep web can be broken up into further sections. So the first piece here is unindexed web content, it's called. Okay, so this is relatively easy to understand. It's stuff that Google can't access. Google does not index your email. Yeah, so when you log into your, your email account, Google doesn't actually record that and I can't search your mail, yeah? So the very fact that you log in means that Google can't see it anymore, so that's unindexed web content. Okay, so you, your Facebook posts, your email, whatever. The next chunk of this, of this iceberg is unresponsive machines. So these are basically systems that are online, they're on the web, but you can't access them. They serve a specific purpose. So this is everything from a printer to a file server to an ATM machine. Yeah, so an ATM machine needs to be able to communicate back to the bank to see do you have money to give it out to you, but of course it doesn't make sense that you'll be able to access that ATM machine from your computer, yeah? And the very bottom piece of this iceberg is the dark net. So this is where a lot of Strange things happen. You will not encounter the dark net without specifically pursuing, trying to gain access to the system. Um, to talk about the dark net, it's more correct to say that there are dark nets. Okay, so there are numerous different systems uh, that exist to provide dark net services. Okay, um, so the first one and the point of, of, of the rest of my slides here is TOR, which stands for the onion router. Now this is the most popular one. So think about that for a second, an onion. You have all these different layers, yeah? So, so the, the onion router, that network, uh, what it's trying to do is mask all these different layers so it's hard for me as a forensic scientist to see what, what's going on at the innermost point there. Um, but of course there are others. This map shows how big the darknet is, more specifically how big Tor is. Um, so you can kind of start to see some of the countries in the world there. Uh, this is representing how many users you have um, per 100,000. Um, so it's not very, very popular, but there are significant uh, uh, groups of, of users in various countries. The larger uh, points on this map 
represent countries whereby there are more people using Tor, using the darknet. So I'm going to explain to you how it works very briefly. So first and foremost, this is how the regular web works. So you, you're here, you're Alice on the left-hand side, you're, you open up your laptop, you're accessing some particular website, you type in ucd.ie, and some stuff happens where you figure out where ucd.ie is, and you talk to some server, which gives you the website. When you then look for google.ie, you, you talk to a different server, and they give you back the website. Now, the way Tor works is that it adds in this additional layer in the middle. Okay, so just for a second here, for me to figure this out as a forensic scientist, what websites are you accessing or what websites or who has accessed this website, I can just investigate this network communication and I can see who's accessing that site. Here is a, a diagram for how Tor works. So you have all of these different machines, other peers, other people on the darknet. When you make your request, you just have to figure out one guy on this, on this system. So you talk to a directory server and that gets you bootstrapped, is the word, into the network. Now, your loading of a website is actually passed and muddled through, back and forth, through all of these different machines in the middle, and eventually some guy asks for website B on your behalf. And that information then gets passed back to you through that same chain. But what's interesting about this is that it's encrypted. So if I was to actually try and listen in on that traffic, I can't see what's going on there. The only thing that's unencrypted in this entire chain is the last piece in red here, okay? Now, if I then come and ask for another website, the path through that network of machines is different. It's a random path each time of generally between five and eight hops, okay? So if I was to try and investigate that, even if I could figure it out, I'd have to go back through five or eight hops. And of course, these machines could be globally distributed. So it's very, very difficult for someone to actually reverse and see who requested this particular website. So, Tor. Uh, these are tools that allow you to access Tor. I must stress here, Tor is not like a, an illegal network, anything, for, uh, anything uh, far from it. It's an anonymizing network. So there are kind of good reasons why someone might use Tor, but there are also bad, bad reasons, right? So to give you an idea, your, your normal start page that you come across, you probably, most people are used to seeing Google, yeah? You access Tor, you generally will go to one of these. These are your dark net search engines. What's interesting here, if you look at the uh, Tor search on the left-hand side, it, it tells you how many pages it's indexing. So how many pages it knows about on the darknet. It's saying 400,000. I don't know the latest number for Google, but it's in the billions. Okay? So it's a very small subset of the web. Yeah? So what can you get on the darknet? Of course, you can ch check your Facebook. Okay? So just last November, Facebook launched a darknet version of their site. You might think, why would, you, why would Facebook do that? If you're in a country that decides to block social media, so for example, the recent, uh, the Arab Spring, yeah? People trying to coordinate their, their protests, they turned to social media, and those countries effectively turned off Facebook and Twitter or whatever else to stop people being able to coordinate. But if you do it through, uh, if you try to access it through the darknet, well, they can't stop you because it's encrypted. They can't see that you're accessing that site. But of course, it's the darknet. There's something remotely sort of sinister about it, yeah? So you can, you can discuss and share literally anything you want. There are no laws. You're relatively safe. You might, you, you, there's a good chance that you won't be found what you're, what you're actually looking at on, on the site. So you have, of course, conspiracy theorists, Roswell, Area 51, that sort of stuff. Um, you've probably heard of WikiLeaks. So WikiLeaks um, dis distribute files, famously the Edward Snowden case, where he got a load of different uh, uh, documents from the US government and then just shared them online. Now, getting into the more sort of illegal stuff, um, you've lost your passport and you want to get a UK passport, you want to change your nationality. So all you have to do is log on to this site here. You can pay uh, the equivalent of two and a half thousand sterling to get this UK passport. And they say that it'll work within the UK and EU. It'll scan with the, uh, the new scannable passports. Uh, they say you'll be in the database. Who knows if that's true or not? If you were to buy one, first of all, will it even arrive? Who knows? You're dealing with a criminal on the dark net. If it was to arrive, it, who's to say it's gonna scan anywhere? Fake driver's licenses. For, for, for uh, drinking purposes mainly, but you can get it with, uh, with the UV uh, um, 
covers. You can get it that it, it, it passes all of the checks that any, any bouncer would have at the door. $50 bills. So, counterfeit money. Look at the price here. So you can buy $150 bills. Who's able to do the maths on that very quick? Yeah, very good. So you can buy $5,000 for the very affordable price of $2,000. You wouldn't get those odds in Vegas. The Silk Road is probably the most famous darknet service. Okay, so, um, so what this was was a, an online marketplace akin to eBay, right? But you could buy and sell literally anything. So the most obvious use of this is for drugs, right? So you can go on here and you can buy stuff. You can, uh, it, ha it has a feedback system, the same as eBay, so you can buy from a reliable seller with good quali quality products and, and a fast delivery time, same as what, what you would look for on eBay. Um, and of course, there's much, much worse on the dark net, which I'm absolutely not going to go into here. So you might be thinking, who would create this? It's a very complex system. It's, it, it, there's thousands, hundreds of thousands of man hours going into developing this system. Well, the answer to that is pretty much the US government. So um, DARPA, which is the De Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, um, they funded it. it. Turns out that spies and the military behind enemy lines have very similar needs with regards to their internet access as criminals. They need to send encrypted data out of that country. But if that country blocks the service, well then they need an alternative. So they turn to the darknet. Okay, so it's quite complex to try and find stuff. Um, there's a whole area of computer science, which, I, which I'm part of in, in, in cybercrime investigation, where we're, we're trying to peel back those layers on the onion. We're trying to find that, that evidence of a crime occurring. Um, we're trying to be able to figure out those different paths. How can we actually get evidence to ultimately prosecute, prosecute a criminal? Um, so that's what we're, we're kind of working on. The FBI has made some inroads. If you, if you, you're all going to go home and try in the darknet now. If you try and buy your, uh, if, you tr if you're trying to buy your marijuana on the Silk Road later on tonight, you'll actually get this screen here. Okay, so uh, the, we the hidden website has been seized. Okay, so the U.S. government is actually able to take control of these sites. But what's interesting is that they're not necessarily doing it from a technical point of view. It's good old-fashioned detective work. Yeah, so they buy some, and they get it delivered, and then they trace that package and they go down through fingerprinting and all of the, the traditional detective work to try and find who's actually on that system.